Namaste everyone. Um, first of all, let me thank uh, Anil Nayarji and uh, Sanjana Nayarji because of inviting me to this uh, policy circle event. Uh, I was on my way to USA and uh, when I got the invitation, I fixed my ticket um, because it, it's very difficult to come back in, in a week's time with all the jet lag that is there. Uh, the event, um, as it is called, uh, India and the New World Order, it's uh, interesting uh, from a various uh, point of view. Uh, where we stand and where we go, it, re it depends on how we think about it. And I, as such, uh, you know, we have been playing a big role in the world order for centuries and decades. So let's uh, let's talk about that in few a uh, few other ways. Before I actually talk. I really need to thank a number of people. After my parents, uh, my PhD advisor, uh, Professor Shambhunath Dutta from IIT Bombay, who trained me in areas of uh, quantum mechanics, and of course my primary school teachers from Assam, and of course a lot of institutions in India. So all, I am fully educated in India, unfortunately or fortunately settled in the USA, and uh, built my career there. And of course my family, which lets me travel. And what I present to you is the experience that I had with lots of people around the world. And uh, so I'll share some of those things. Since my introduction was done, I'm going to skip that. But let's look at the rear view mirror in terms of technology, right? What has happened? <coughs> if you look at why are we talking about emerging technology especially, what happened was the internet, right? Computers were there, 90s. But then internet came and one of the companies that actually had the vision of connecting everybody was called America Online. I was fortunate to work there in the operation side. And I can tell you in the year 1999 and 2000, we used to get terabytes of data. So that was called real data. Now, even today, if you look at the other industries, whether energy industry, manufacturing, uh, or other industries that are big, they will say that they have lots of data. But try to find out where it is, is the one of the biggest challenges. So if you look at it, what, what happened? In those days, in the early, late 90s and early 2000s, one of the biggest revolutions that took place that we could connect people. We could collect millions of people in less than five years. Whereas before that, any other industrial revolution, we could not do that. This also not only led to innovation in computing technology, right? We, if many of you would remember, we used to have floppy disks and network card which were uh, what I call aggressive, uh, hard to configure, but this internet connectivity allows people to connect multiple networks. So a lot of innovation started taking place in terms of the network technology. Now the, now the attention span of human beings is very short. So when they came on the internet, they would not spend too much time. And if we have to make money from advertising, we have to really reduce, show more advertisements in that time. So the response rate has to be really good. That led to understanding how to manage and analyze the data in real time. That required new kinds of technology in terms of, say, image compression, right? Or how do I move the data from, say, US to Australia to UK? Because it, it, it was a global world, right? So this whole computing technology started. And as a result, today you see a lot of disruptors, which you call, some of you would call Google and the Facebook and the Twitters of the world, right? If you look at Twitter, it started with 140 characters. That used to be actually a status message on AOL instant messenger. So they just flipped the model. So you see, what can, what can give you new ideas can come out of some of the technology solutions that took place. Right? Now, if you look at these things, uh, and today many of you have heard this uh, fancy term called chat GPT. Now, in my early 2000, you got 5 million people in 5 years, so to say, connected. With chat GPT, 1 million was done in less than a week. That's the power of the technology that we are talking about. Right? This has led to what I call the disruption uh, through exponential technology. And what are these exponential technology? You can actually put them in five categories. One is evolving categories, empowering categories, exponential ca value creation categories, and efficiency. And the other ones are the future disruptor. Some of those terms you heard earlier today, first of all, let's look at some evolving technology sensors. We talk about sensors in refineries, we talk about sensors in cars, but there is a whole new, new set of sensors that will come called nanosensors and biosensors. How are we actually going to take them? The second
second set of evolving technology is called algorithmic materials. Right, we use the same cement, for example, to build the build the buildings. But if you really want smart cities and smart buildings, you really need to des design those cement or whatever those from basis of algorithms, which will take data not just from the building material, but also from the weather and the change in the climate that's going to take place. Right. The other evolving technology that all of you hear today is called metaverse. I don't know how many of you have heard of something called second life before. Uh, so AOL was first metaverse, so to say, if you want to call it. Then came Second Life, which not, not many people talk about. And now today we are talking about metaverse in terms of uh, much more in the Web 3.0 concept, right? But the most uh, important of all connecting all these technologies is called the geospatial technology. How much of we do with remote sensing? India has, India has produced a large number of remote sensing scientists. But the irony of it is that if you look at the city like Dehradun, right, which has some of the best institutes who know how to pipeline everything, but there is no part, pipeline for drainage system in the whole city, right? So you have the remote sensing world next in Rurki, but they can't implement the same technology in that sense. And of course, the wireless technology, right? Then comes the empowering. Uh, okay. Then comes the empowering technologies. What are those? I think you somebody heard about AR, VR, but these are actually uh, augmented reality, virtual reality is there. But how much are we actually using it in schools, for example, or in colleges? There are already, for example, friends of ours, of course, of Indian origin too. She runs a company which actually trains the army people of US on F-16 fighter jet training through AR, VR system. So they're way ahead of the curve, but those can be implemented here as well. Of course, the cloud computing paradigm has changed completely everything. 3D printing is another one of them. A uh, uh, couple of years back, I was in Ecuador about, uh, I would say, eight, nine years ago. They actually turned a what is called sugarcane mill into an innovation center, and basically in the yard, whole yard, they just put 3D printing machines so that every person can learn how to build things. Right? That is how you leverage old infrastructure for modern things. Right? Of course, the proximity technology is becoming beacons and IoT sensors become very important for us. But then, the mo but where does these all fall? They fall that you can create exponential value. That means one of the terms that if you use is big data. Right, I've spent 30 years in it, retired from it, uh, and of course, exponent, and then artificial intelligence, which is nothing new, 60 years old, nothing new has been done. It's the implementation of it is very important. Right, the scaling is very important. Then of course, chatbots are there, robots, drones, and all those things terms are used. But one of the most important of those technologies is nanotechnology. How much we are doing? So let's like, take an example. How do we leverage nanotechnology in material? And if, especially if you want to talk about security, how do we actually apply it to the frontline workers, right? Can we actually embed nanoparticles in the uniforms of the army people so that they have actually the right temperature at the right place in the right environment? Right, so that kind of R&D could be done in this case. Then of course the efficiency technologies are there, which is like FinTech, health tech. You know, a lot of people earlier talked about health, health tech or other things in pharmaceutical. I spent many years doing drug discovery projects. But the thing is currently the most of the focus in the healthcare on what is called personalized medicine is only about how to make money for the organization. There is not much on the treatment side. So which is which they could learn from say the homeopathies and the Ayurvedic world as well because those were more personalized than anything. So there is a lot of technology needs to be implemented in that case. And then of course the future technology is the quantum computing, right? I, did pro I used to work in the areas of photosynthesis and by you applying quantum mechanics, even today, one chloroplast molecule has 4,096 4, chlorophyll molecules. To do computation on it, even today, is not possible. So I'm waiting for that quantum computer to be there. Right? So if you really want to do really a highly optimized problem, quantum computing will help. Then, of course, there is a whole clean tech and blockchain kind of technologies that fall into the future disruption. Now, how does one really take advantage of these technologies? And why should we take it? If you look at it, all these technologies fit into what is called, I call national security, which is basically energy security. And energy security is all about energy at the lowest cost possible, right? That is sustainable and resilient. And that is for current and future needs. Now, I think somebody was asking earlier about new discoveries. Uh, it's, it, we need new discoveries, right? Two minutes. Um, and if you look at the current usage of oil and hydrocarbons in the world, it's about 8,000 million ton equivalent. In order to replace, if you want to really meet our net zero target, you need billions of photovoltaic cells. 
the geothermal uh, right uh, all these things are needed in com combination in order to have an optimized your energy transition landscape you really need to know how to manage the data and in order to manage the data learn from it one has to have a new kind of thinking so what kind of thinking you need is i will have a little quiz here make it little interactive for professor charan singh uh, i have a question for you what do you see here i can only think of the time all right <laughs> All of you, what do you see here? Mammoth. Very good. Mammoth with small ears. Oh, mammoth with small ears. Elephant. Not elephant. Not elephant. Not happy. Huh? Not happy. Okay. What else? So most of us focus. So most of us focus on the animal, right? That is our nature, right? it's more than the more than the animal and this is where the gap is in understanding technology we know what we know and we always look for that when you go for technology things people will only say what i know and they will want the same technology but emerging technology is something beyond it so let's play, let's take a second question i'll come to that so it's actually a mastered and it's the same thing right because you you if you look carefully it is the same sort color right So now, what do you see? Again, elephant, African elephant, <laughs> lesser trees. No. So the landscape of technology is very complex. So do if we really want to implement it, we have to look at the whole picture. We can't just look at the elephant, right? and this is this is this is how the new kind of thinking is needed and that kind of thinking actually comes according to me for what i call the avatar challenge and that avatar challenge you know the only successful person in the in the whole universe is hanuman ji right he has never failed you can read roman mythology you can read greek mythology you can read bible you can read quran you can read other books only person who has never failed is hanuman ji right the reason is because he had the knowledge he ha he used his brain and he focused on the truth so that's what the gyan pragya and sat is because it actually allows you to cover everything right it can you look things in a, in a holistic manner you actually build the network if you think of it hanuman ji was the perfect networker in the world right with self self what is selfless devotion so he got uh, bivishan a kingdom he got to grieve a kingdom but nothing for himself right so this is the power of actually using the knowledge and the, and the brains when you focus on a, a real truth what is going to be and if you look at it all this is under the foundation of what i call the data that means we for in order to for this challenge to be it has to be always versatile adaptable transformative agile and resilient right because otherwise we can't do that and that requires that we really have data and that that will lead you that data is provides the fire and it is the art of possible and in order to get that you have to go to art of decision making that is what is needed and if we do that then we can have the convergence of technology people in into the era of ir 4.0 and if we don't then we have a problem that means we really need to act now if we don't disrupt ourselves as a nation then there will be others who will keep disrupting us and this is the time to really focus on true digital transformation or disruption change our mindset and talent and keep that pace with the technology that is there thank you so much